a genius. Now, what I want to say is that the arrow of time problem is different in these different eras. During this phase, the hot Big Bang phase, the expansion of the universe provides the arrow of time for quasi-equilibrium physics. You've got your mixture, and the temperature is dropping, that top-down action I talk about. And that falling temperature provides an arrow of time. Now, most processes are reversible, but some processes at that time are non-reversible, particularly nucleosynthesis. And it's these non-equilibrium phases that give the real arrow of time. And it's the remnants from these non-equilibrium phases, which we have got today, um, which are the result of the arrow of time of the irreversible processes. Now, in nucleosynthesis, where does the arrow come from? And you can make a case it comes from this reaction. N goes to P plus E plus nu. Now, why does it go, the arrow of time go that way? Because there is an equal and opposite process going the other way. Well, the answer is very simple. This goes from one particle to three, and that goes from three particles to one. That means this is much more likely than that one because these three particles have to coincide to make it go that way, but going this way, it can just happen spontaneously. In other words, the single reaction is much more likely than the triple reaction. As the temperature falls, this gives you an arrow of time, and you incorporate these uh, neutrons in the deuterium, and the ones which haven't decayed that way then are the remnants of this non-equilibrium phase. The nuclear reactions stop when it's cooler still with the neutrons bound into the deuterium. So what I'm saying is during this time, there's a very good case for saying it is the expansion of the universe which gives you the arrow of time. I agree with what, is, uh, what you just said, except the fact that you need a three bond problem. You know, you can build up the neutron by step to three bond. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Otherwise, I agree that the expansion is cool. Yeah. In the box, you during the time that structure formation takes place, you're no longer in equilibrium. Matter and radiation are decoupled, and gravitational attraction is spontaneously creating matter in the universe. The time reverse is possible, but doesn't happen because of the smooth initial condition. So you go from smooth to lumpy, basically, because you start off smooth, so the only direction you can go is lumpy. Um, and you have to explain these improbable initial conditions, and inflation is supposed to explain them, and Penrose says it doesn't explain them. Almost all inflationary universe studies do not address the question of inhomogeneity because virtually 95% of the papers on inflation assume the universe is spatially homogeneous to start with. There are very, very few papers looking at inhomogeneity and inflation. What Penrose says is inflation does not solve the arrow of time problem. You need special, not generic initial conditions for the arrow of time to work. And his point is that if the whole universe was made up of huge amounts of black holes, which would be, that would have much more entropy than what we actually see. In order that the universe can evolve, you mustn't have a whole lot of black holes, which would be the much more generic condition. It would be a much higher entropy initial state. Now, the third phase is the one which is most puzzling in many ways, when you have the isolated systems, like the solar system, because the effect of the expansion of the universe on the solar system is negligible. The effect of the radiation that is coming in is negligible. The microwave background radiation, we have to use our most sensitive detectors to determine the microwave background radiation. So, for instance, you can't say that the arrow of time on the Earth comes because the background radiation temperature is dropping, which might be one hypothesis, because the microwave background radiation is negligible. So the direct expansion of the universe, unlike that hard early phase, does have no effect. Um, the arrow of time in the local universe, in the local solar system, it is dominant on a macroscopic scale, as we all know, um, where does it come from? Either from initial conditions at the start of the solar system, which are different from those at the end, or from a no incoming condition. Somehow, that it is the electromagnetic boundary conditions at infinity in the universe which do, in fact, give you the arrow of time on the Earth and in the local solar system. And that really is a very puzzling kind of thing, and I find still I really don't understand that in any depth. So anyhow, what I hope that I have done with all of this is get you to think a little bit about this really very intriguing business of the interaction of the local universe and the far distant universe. So I think I will conclude here.
Microphysics influences macrophysics in many ways. That's bottom-up interaction. Macrophysics influences local physics in many ways. That's top-down interaction. It's this interconnection that creates the unity of the universe that I started talking about, the interdependence of the part and the whole. The universe sets up local systems and then continues to influence them but doesn't interfere. Let me explain what I mean by that. When you have local isolated systems like the solar system, they become isolated because the universe does not send in high-intensity photons. It does not send in high-intensity gravitational waves. It does not send in many high-intensity um, particles. It is because of specific conditions in the universe that we can think of the solar system as being isolated to a very high degree after it has been formed. So the universe allows isolated the systems to evolve as independent autonomous systems. Many universes, you can imagine, would not allow any isolated system to exist because gravitational waves would be coming in, high-intensity photons and so on, and local physics wouldn't be possible and local life wouldn't be possible because you wouldn't be able to... There wouldn't be enough uh, equilibrium time for the thousands of millions of years needed for evolution to succeed. One of the most important macro-micro influences is the arrow of time, and we still don't really know how it works. For instance, how it takes place in the quantum collapse of the wave function, if you believe in that. One of the most important effects is that almost certainly it is controlled by the universe as a whole, but quite how is unclear. So, the uniqueness of the universe, was this kind of development necessary in which isolated systems evolve? Or do we need a multiverse to explain it? Well, this is one of these ongoing kinds of sagas. And um, so I won't go back to the multiverse thing because I've talked about that before. But what I want to just conclude with, seeing I mentioned it last time, um, I finished that part. I just want to add in something. I mentioned last time this quote from David Hilbert about micro... Uh, infinities, and I thought you might like to see it as the last thing I will give you in my lectures in this course. This is from David Hilbert on the infinite in Philosophy of Mathematics, a book put out in 1964. Our principal result is that the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role for the infinite is that an idea which transcends all is that of an idea which transcends all experience and completes the concrete as a totality. And so if we go back and think about how does this situation come about which allows life to exist and so on, the multiverse explanation which I've talked about with you is one possibility. Many people talking about the multiverses claim there's an infinite number of universes out there in the multiverse. Well, I think that's a highly dubious proposition. And this is a quote from David Hilbert which sort of supports that. Infinity is a quantity which by its very nature can never be physically attained. That's the nature of infinity. However far you go, you never get there. And so it cannot be attained. The concept itself implies its inability to be realized in physical terms. It's a code word for it continues without end or it's unattainable. So if we return back to one of the questions I've asked, could the space sections of the universe be infinite? Could the universe create infinite space sections? Whatever your creation process is, it's very, very dubious that any physical process could obtain, create infinite space sections. Very large, yes, but infinite, that's very dubious. So people say, well, but what about Euclidean space is infinite? So yes, well, where is there a Euclidean space in physical reality? There aren't any. Euclidean space is stretching to infinity in physical reality. And so that's just a sort of a reprise of something I said a time or so ago about infinity and the existence of infinities in the real universe or in ensembles of universes. Thank you. <laughs> may not be connected to anything you say, but I think at a deeper level it may be. Um, which is this question that if you explain the expansion of the universe to a lay person, an intelligent lay person, this is the kind of question you get, which is that 
if the expansion universe is pushing galaxies apart, then it should also be pushing the stars in the galaxy yeah. apart and the Earth apart yeah. and the Sun. Yeah. So this is never addressed uh, in the textbooks and in the flood of junk papers that come out. Okay. Now, the, what people like Baker said is that you have to match the metric. Okay. So around the galaxy, you treat the galaxy as a point. You have the Schwarzschild sure metric. Yeah. But then, at some point, you have to join on to the robertson walking yes. But there's some subtleties in this joint, which I think may be related to this thing you call local global and so on. Yes. Now, what do you think of this issue? No, I think it's a very interesting thing. I mean, at a physical level, the statement will be, and I actually said it way back, um, yeah. that um, local, local physical systems have condensed out from the local expansion. And you must always remember, the point which I made early on, and I make it again, the Robertson-Walker metric is an average metric which is only applicable on scales larger than a certain scale. It doesn't apply. It's the wrong metric. But what's the certain scale? scale? So? What, what, what do you mean by certain scale? scale? <laughs> um, that's a physical question. The physical question is on what scale are there bound clusters of matter and what not. Now, pe people have discussed this. In fact, the, 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 the famous paper on this is Einstein and Strauss in 1947, which constructed explicitly what's come to be called a Swiss cheese universe, exactly what you're saying, where you have a Schwarzschild solution here and a Robertson-Walker one here. And Einstein and Strauss worked out the boundary conditions and developed it in some detail, and later people like Schucking and so on have done that. But they did that as a mathematical thing. And the point is, if you, you can mathematically join a Robertson-Walker space onto a Schwarzschild, now, there's a problem here because this is empty and this is not empty. So you've got big jumps taking place as you do that junction. You've got to dig up your um, Israel junction conditions and do all of that. You can do that. It's been done by quite a lot of people. But what this doesn't tell you is, well, where should you put that boundary? So what it does tell you is that here there is no effect of the expansion, period, no effect. But, 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 but what Einstein and Strauss never gave was a prescription of where you choose this boundary to be. Um, there is actually a small sub-literature on this which does keep going. You'll find it in the American Journal of Physics. About once a year a paper comes up. No, but tell me one correct paper because people come to Santa Barbara and tell me this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I don't know, you know most of them, I assume. Um, tell me one correct paper. Well, the original Einstein and Strauss paper, which is uh, 1947, I think, I think is basically it's correct. It's on the web. No. <laughs> oh, well... <laughs> It, it should be, hasn't the American Physical Society? It's Fizrev. Yeah, it's 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 yeah, I think so. But also, there's a paper by Engelbert Schucking as one of the people who's written about this. And fairly recently, there is a paper by Martin, who is the guy at the National Science uh, in charge of the Smithsonian? I don't know. I've heard it from Timo Mottola, but yeah. people do not believe it's black hole. Yeah. <laughs> No, no, no. Um, I, Einstein basically did, did, did the basic thing, and people have sort of glossed over it since then and redone the calculations, but you'll find the basic calculation, Einstein and Strauss, in which they show you can join Robertson Walker onto Schwarzschild with reasonable boundary conditions. Then if you think about what happens there, the universe is not being pushed apart. It really begins expanding, slowly pulls itself back together under its own attraction, and may in fact eventually be closed. It's only the one that 